My name is James Fox Higgins, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of The Rational Rise, and it's a real pleasure to be introducing our speakers today. Uh, the question is, are Christianity and liberty like oil and water? It's a subject dear to my own heart, so I'm, uh, I've got to <laughs> really try hard to keep my mouth shut and not take up any time. So I'm going to jump straight in with introducing our first speaker. We've got uh, Darren Brady Nelson. He's a man of split national allegiance, or perhaps none at all. Uh, born and raised in Milwaukee and now calling Brisbane home, Darren is a conservative libertarian and a Christian. He's economically advised Senator Malcolm Roberts and the Trump for President campaign. Please give it up for Darren. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a presentation. I'll, I'll sort of just try to go through it quickly and um, paraphrase it. Um, hopefully there'll be some opportunity to make presentations available to people who are interested because um, there's a lot of interesting information in my opinion in this one. Um, this isn't strictly related to the topic, um, uh, but there's a, there's a good quote which you can't read, but I shall read out to you by um, John Lennox, who's a scientist and, and, a, and a Christian, um, just to set the scene a little bit. Um, faith is a, is a response to evidence, not a rejoicing in the absence of evidence. It is no part of the biblical view that things should be believed where there is no evidence. Dawkins, Richard Dawkins' definition of faith as blind faith, turns out, therefore, to be the exact opposite of the biblical one. Um, so my thesis today, um, might as well get straight to the point. Um, from what I know, um, in my experiences, um, I've been a libertarian for, you know, a couple decades, if you like. Um, I was raised a, you know, sort of a once a week Catholic, if you like, um, and I was an atheist slash agnostic for most of my adult life until about three years ago when I returned to Christianity, or maybe maybe not so much return, maybe I just, that was the beginning. Yeah. Um, so in my opinion, Christianity is by far and away the most compatible religious faith or spiritual belief with liberty. Um, and there's a, a bit of a contrast, and again, if you want to get this presentation, there's, there's some pretty interesting stuff in here. Um, in my opinion, um, there's actually one religion that sticks out as being the exact opposite, and that's Islam. Um, I might throw in the religion of atheism as well, because I haven't met too many atheists that weren't pretty religious about their views. Um, just to also uh, to set the scene a little bit, let's, let's go over what liberty is. Um, according to Ludwig von Mises, um, he stated it as, liberty is always freedom from the government. Now you might want to tone it down and say freedom from big government, that's fine. Um, certainly the, the size of government we have today is, is just ridiculous. Um, another, uh, Professor Walter Block kind of expanded on that a bit more. He goes, uh, liberty is a political philosophy. It, it's concerned solely with the proper use of force. Its core premise is that it should be illegal to threaten or initiate violence against a person or property without their permission. Force is justified only in defense or retaliation. Um, and importantly, this applies to government as well. Um, and Walter Block um, also, he's quite interesting because he used to be one of the, uh, you know, we have a lot of libertarians that are very anti-religion, um, and usually Christianity is the religion that they target the most. They think of the Crusades and Inquisition and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's, Walter Block pointed out, that's exactly how he used to view it, and he's changed his mind. Um, he, uh, he's actually become a, a Christian himself, but he would say even just as, as a libertarian position, um, religion, and particularly Christianity, is one of the last best hopes for society, um, as it is one of the main institutions that's still um, still competing valiantly with an excessive, excessive and overblown government. Um, just quickly also mentioning just on liberty itself, uh, uh, Murray Rothbard has a, a, an excellent essay where he sets out six myths, if you like, of liberty, um, but three of them are particularly pertinent. Um, uh, one of the myths that he points out is liberty assumes people are libertines or, or hedonists. Um, you know, and obviously he goes through to say that's not necessarily the case. Um, also, often people assume that um, liberty is about atheism and materialism, um, and, but that's not necessarily the case either. Um, or liberty assumes people are all good, um, or you know, on the left, obviously, they assume everybody's all bad. Well, it's a, it's a mix. It's a mix in reality. It, we're always a mix. Each one of us is a mix, even over time. So um, 
On the Christianity, um, a great author who I happen to know um, from the Cato Institute, Doug Bando, he, he has an excellent book um, called Beyond Good Intentions, A Biblical View of Politics. Um, and he certainly, he talks through and he gets a lot of, if you like, libertarian plus Christian theology to sort of prove his point, you know, that at least, you know, that the, the state should be limited in what it does. Um, and in particular, I find this a very interesting thing. Um, and, there's many reasons for it, and he points um, not just to ideas of liberty, but ideas in the Bible. Uh, but the, the sort of the, one of the most interesting ones, if you like, um, is he says, look, you know, the, particularly the way the states become nowadays, and it's actually not the first time in history it's become like this. The Roman Empire got this way as well. Um, basically, the all-powerful state acts as a secular god. And this is basically, a, you know, a breach of the first commandment, that you shall have no other gods before me. And you know anybody, particularly in the libertarian movement, think that through. You'll find that people do treat government almost as like their god, their religion. Obviously, people on the left more so. Um, although there's people on the right who do it as well. Um, yeah, and this and th this is a, just a brief summary, um, just to get the conversation started. Um, uh, after after um, Wendy's talk, hopefully we'll have a bit of an open forum, um, but. Um, Quoting from another fellow from uh, the, the Mises Institute, um, he wrote a paper, The Importance of Christian Thought for, for the American Libertarian Movement. Um, two things are particularly interesting that, that he points out, that um, you know, certainly in America, and I've noticed the difference between here and Australia, um, most libertarians here tend to be atheists, actually, whereas in America, they tend to be Christians. Um, and actually, particularly in America, it was even, you know, actually most people were looking for their inspiration for their libertarian viewpoint in Christianity, and not so much from Mises and Hayek and Friedman and people like that. Um, and he, he, he says, Jesus, you know, Jesus gave us the choice, individual freedom, to believe in him or not. Um, it actually goes deeper than that. You know, in, in my reading, and, and I am an amateur when it comes to theology, I'm, I'm a professional economist, so I know that a lot better. But my reading of, of Christianity, and I've read up on Islam, I've read up on Buddhism, I've read up on Hinduism, and a number of other religions, it's the only one that really says, you've been given free will. You know, God's not there sort of as a puppet master, sort of um, telling you what to do. Or even the, the sort of the atheists, you know, who, particularly ones who are, you know, have a religious devotion to evolution, beyond the science. You know, basically we're these puppets, you know, so uh, that's fine. Um, or we're still, we're just like ants, so it's okay what you, you, know, you do with us. We can social engineer and all that sort of stuff. So Christianity, really above all the religions, um, you know, rejects that viewpoint. Um, we're individuals, you know. Ultimately, you can be saved. There's no collective salvation. There's only you. We obviously work and, and we're encouraged to be social with each other um, and have com you know, community get married, friends, all that sort of stuff, but the fact is, and most libertarians would agree with this, but ultimately we're us, we're just one individual. Um, I probably, um, I was going to sort of highlight some um, interesting um, facts, you know, at least to stir up the pot a bit on Islam, but I'll just stick with Christianity for a little bit longer. Um, there's a, a great paper um, by Lawrence Reed uh, of the Foundation for Economic Education called Rendering Unto Caesar was Jesus a Socialist, and I certainly encourage you to read it. Um, it's an e excellent essay, but anyway, he, said, he comes to a conclusion, um, a number of conclusions, but the main thing is, he says, in spite of the attempts of many modern day progressives to make him into a welfare state redistributionist, Jesus was nothing of the sort. Um, and particularly, he was pointing out, um, particularly what he thought of, of he, um, it was almost like a proto-welfare state that some of the, the, the Pharisees were getting involved with, and just that, the hypocrisy of it that he had no time for. It wasn't real charity. And the welfare state is exactly that. That's not charity. You know, that's it's a complete stretch of the, the term. Um, and anybody like to hear a little bit about Islam, or should I just uh, finish up? Uh, well, I'll certainly, um, and again, come get the presentation either directly from me or, or we'll put up online or something like that. But there are a number of, of great references I can um, put you to. One of, the, one of them is a website called the religion of peace, um, and uh, I love a quote from that, it goes, it's far easier to act as if critics of Islam have a problem with Muslims as people, than it is to accept the uncomfortable truth that Islam is different. Um, 
And in my studies, it is different. Um, sadly, actually, um, it's not radical Islam. It's not, you know, fanatics. That unfortunately, their holy book calls for violence. It calls for the you know way women are treated or gay people or all that sort of stuff. Um, and the life that Muhammad lived is a stark contrast to the life that Jesus lived. Um, uh, Muhammad was a warrior. Um, you know, from a warrior's point of view, he was a bloody good warrior. Um, you know, he led over 80 jihads himself, killed many people, personally got involved in rape. Um, he had a six-year-old bride who he later consummated that uh, uh, consummated his wedding with, um, uh, marriage with, sorry, when she was nine. Um, and why is Muhammad important? Um, he's the only prophet for that religion, unlike the Bible, where there's many voices, if you like. Um, and also, uh, he is held up as you know, sort of the ideal person in Islam. So this is the, you know, just like obviously Jesus is held up as this is what we'd all like to be. Obviously it's pretty hard to be like that. Um, and another just important part with Islam um, is in, in the Quran, um, it's accepted that whatever comes later on in the Quran overrides what comes earlier in the Quran. So yes, there's peaceful bits and whatnot and stuff that looks, oh, yeah, not too bad actually, near the beginning, but towards the end, it, it's quite bellicose. Um, and again, if you want to, just um, to put the things in uh, a little bit of perspective, um, in terms of Islam, jihad, if you like, Islamic terrorism, I would call it jihad, has killed twice as many people in one month than were killed in 350 years of the Inquisition. Um, jihadists have murdered more people every day than the KKK has in the last 70 years. Um, also, jihadists in Iraq, in one single day, um, killed more people than all of the criminals executed in America over the last 40 years. So that's just a bit of context. Um, I hand it over to Wendy. Cool, all right, our next speaker is Wendy Francis. Wendy is the Queensland Director of the Australian Christian Lobby, the ACL. The ACL is, not, is a not-for-profit organization that wants Christian principles and ethics accepted and influencing the way we are governed, do business, and relate as a society. Give it up for Wendy. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining this um, session. I'm just going to start um, straight in and say, what does the Bible actually say about Christian Christianity? Because I think we let's go to the source book. So when we're talking about liberty and freedom and whether um, that is compatible with Christianity, this is what Christianity says, this is what the Bible says. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Um, we move to Galatians, it said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. In Galatians, so this is straight from our holy book, okay? Uh, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So this is the freedom that Christianity actually calls for. Uh, Christianity calls for people to live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So if that's what Christians are called for, can we look and see in history where Christians have actually behaved in this way? Is that something that we can look at? And I would um, say to you, absolutely. So we look through history and we see people like William Wilberforce who um, worked for the freedom of slaves. We see people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer who worked for the freedom of the oppressed and particularly for the Jews in Nazi Germany. We look at someone like Mother Teresa who worked for the freedom of the most poor in Calcutta. We look at people like Rosa Parks who's personally one of my very big favorites who looked um, for the freedom of her people to be able to live in dignity in the United States of America. And we look at somebody like Father Douglas Barzi, who at this very time is working for freedom for not just Christians, but minorities in Mosul um, who have been displaced from, uh, from their homes, will not be able to return to their homes um, and are in uh, centres. He prefers not to call them camps. So we look at people who are acting um, because of what they see as in the Bible says, live as free people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up, but living as servants of God. And this is how these people have acted out that instruction in the Bible. So when we see Australia moving away from what we have um, grown up as an understanding of the Judeo-Christian heritage that we have, 
then we see us moving away. What are we moving away to? And are we losing freedoms as we move away from an understanding of a Judeo-Christian heritage? We talked um, in the previous session in this room about same-sex marriage, and it was couched um, always in that this is a religious argument. I would really say that that's not the case. There are many people who don't agree with same-sex marriage who are not coming from a religious perspective. And there are many people in Australia who appreciate our Judeo-Christian heritage who are not necessarily personally coming from a Christian perspective themselves. But they are coming from an understanding that this Judeo-Christian heritage has stood us in very good stead, particularly in the area of freedom. And so as we move away from an understanding of Judeo-Christian heritage, what are we seeing? We're seeing a lack of freedom for parents to raise their children. We are seeing a lack of freedom to speak freely. I certainly experienced that. I'm grateful today to be able to speak freely, even if you disagree with me. This is one of the things I love about Andrew and I love about libertarians is that they're happy for me to actually speak freely and happy to disagree with me and still go and have a coffee or a beer together and be friends. It's good to be able to disagree and be friends. Um, but that's not becoming necessarily the case in Australia. I'm not always allowed to speak freely and we're not always allowed to meet peacefully. And so can I just briefly touch on the parental thing because that's quite dear to my heart. I have three married children, we have 10 grandchildren. And um, so the, the, my kids who are bringing up their grandchildren are finding that their freedoms to bring up their children are actually being curtailed. And so we have, um, in the uh, safe schools particularly stuff at the top, there may arise circumstances in which students wish to change their gender identity without the consent of their parents and without consulting medical practitioners. And then it goes on to explain to teachers how to get around that problem. It is a real problem for them, obviously. Down the bottom, um, again from safe schools, if a student does not have family or carer support for the process to change gender, to move from one gender to another, we're having an, an outbreak of children wanting to change their gender. Um, in our hospitals in Australia, they start at the age of three. Uh, if the student does not have family or care support for the process, a decision to proceed should be made on the school's duty of care for the student's wellbeing, taking it out of the control of the parents' hands. On Education HQ Australia, and I've got all the links to this, this is not hidden anywhere, this is actually quite well known. Teachers quickly learn to steer clear of topics which could generate indignant and outraged emails from parents who see themselves as moral guardians. Since when did it become a bad thing for a parent to see themselves as the moral guardian of their children? I am shocked by that statement. And so what are parents outraged and worried about? Why are they emailing schools outraged? Why are they seeing themselves as moral guardians? Because of this sort of stuff. What does it mean to be bisexual? Children 11 to 14 year olds are being taught in our schools. Not worrying about who I want to like and so forth. It's just meeting a person and being able to say, you're really nice to me and I like you. I've just met Darren today. I've never met him before. I actually think he's a nice person and I quite like him and I'm not bisexual. Um, and, I, and I don't think he is either. But uh, so teaching that to our children is getting outraged emails from parents and they have every right to have an outraged email. Safe Schools promotes a biology that this is a, a video, you can go online and have a look, it's Nevo. Nemo is a biologically female 17 year old who used to identify as lesbian. She now identifies as a straight male. She is telling 11 to 14 year olds in school in a class video that surgery should not be delayed for adolescents who want to transition from one gender to another. And that is why parents are sending outraged emails and that is why they are acting as moral guardians of their children. And so we have um, the late Bill Leake, who, who put up some uh, incredible cartoons, and this was one of my favourites. Ready for school? I've packed your laptop, Valium, Ritalin, Mace, chest binder, strap on, and a delicious peanut butter sandwich, and the child is horrified because she's going to take peanut butter to school, and that could be actually outlawed, but everything else was fine. So um, the... the the um, founder of the Safe Schools program is Ros Ward, and so we're coming from a Marxist ideology as opposed to what has traditionally been a Christian ideology. Okay, so we're coming from a Marxist ideology. We, I don't need to tell you what Marxism is here at this conference. I often have to explain it, but I don't need to explain it to you. Um, Ros is, uh, I don't just teach people how to be gay, I teach them how to be gay and communist. Um, she says, now we just need to get rid of the racist Australian flag on top of state parliament, get a red one up there and my work is done. In the Communist um, Solidarity magazine, September 2017, 
Winning equal marriage will be a blow against bigotry, but homophobia and transphobia will persist until we get rid of capitalism and the family. And so we go back to Australia's um, past and we look at Robert Menzies. So this is, this is not a new fight, but it is one that is very, very relevant today for each one of us here. And Robert Menzies says, if you secure a copy of the Communist Manifesto and look at chapter two, you will see how it embraces the abolition of the family. It's not new. And so um, what about free speech? What about free speech and the freedom to meet together? So this is actually, if it wasn't so serious, it would actually be funny. Um, I had a, a, uh, a Catholic group ask me to come and speak to them about safe schools. And this meeting had been set up probably three or four months before the plebiscite was called. But unfortunately, in a really um, marriage of weird events, um, I can say, the, the event was on the day that the plebiscite was actually called. And so in the week leading up to the event, we had, I had received all sorts of terrible threats. And um, so my bosses actually said, we're not going ahead with the event. The reason why was the police had said that they could not guarantee my safety. I badly wanted to go ahead with the event. It annoyed me so much that we called it. And Lyle Shelton called it and I, I was not a happy chappy. Um, but we did, we called it. So no one turned up. Everybody was told the meeting was actually not on. Um, there was a, an elderly man who went with a friend to stay at the church to make sure if anybody did come, that they would be turned away. But unfortunately for the lefties, they had already told the media that they would be there and so they all turned up. So we, the first thing was Brisbane Marriage Clash. The meeting was about safe schools. It was not about marriage. There was nothing about marriage in that meeting and I could show you my notes. It was about safe schools. Media all reported, huge Brisbane marriage clash. There was two men there and about 100 protesters. It was only Andrew Bolt who really started coming out and saying the ugly same-sex clash that wasn't. And so, yes, a, a removal of um, our Christian ethic is producing a, a lessening of our freedoms in our country. I was interested to see this book from Oz Guinness. Uh, he wrote A Free People's Suicide and he came up with this golden triangle of freedom. And I would posit to you that this is something really worth thinking about, and it's my last slide, in saying that freedom requires virtue, virtue requires faith of some sort, and faith requires freedom to actually um, act uh, according to what, it, what we believe. And so without those things, then that golden triangle of freedom really doesn't exist. And so do Christianity and freedom go together? Absolutely. And without it, Australia is actually a poorer place and we are becoming a place with less freedom, not more. Well, we're a bit short for time, but I'll take one question from each side. If anyone has one, you can start, sir. Thank you. I'm after an Islamic school's watchdog and also regulation of mosques, by the way. And I wonder how you might rationalise me wanting to regulate what is taught in Islamic schools about girls being second class, women being less important than men, and those sorts of things, which I want to regulate. At the same time, you want to claim complete freedom for you to teach what you want under your religion. How can we deal with both of those? I think that, um, the way that we deal with both of those is the law of Australia. And so if what I'm teaching actually goes against the law of Australia, and this is one of the big issues with freedom of religion and same-sex marriage, by the way, but if what I'm teaching goes against the law of the country, then I think that that should be stopped. So teaching that girls are second class, teaching that girls are somehow inferior, um, teaching that girl brides are okay, that goes against the law of our country. And so if Christianity in any way or our schools are teaching something that goes against the law of our country, then we have a democratic country. And this is, um, you know, dem democracy is not perfect, but it's what we've got and it's the best we've got. And so um, I believe that Australians have a right to say what is right and wrong in, in our democratic process. And if, if any school is actually teaching something that is not Australian um, law, then that should be stopped. Does anyone have a question for Darren? No? I, I have a question for Darren. Okay. Go a bit further down from what you laid out already, and that was about the common law, really, and how that impacts on liberty and freedoms, and how that ties into Christianity. Because I, I've still seen that the Judeo Christian, just as Judeo Christian heritage is actually being a 
I think you're definitely going beyond my expertise, unfortunately. But um, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, I'm kind of a, a recent returnee to, to Christianity. Um, I know a reasonable amount about the history of the common law, but I don't know much how it um, interacts with Christianity or the sort of you know Judeo-Christian culture. I'm sure there's a strong interaction. Um, what I know of the common law, at least in a basic way, this isn't 100% true, but it is definitely law that was not instituted by government. It, you know, it's as, as close as you get to, if you like, free market law, libertarian law. Um, the people designed it. Um, the judges, um, certainly for quite some time, were not government employees or stooges, which they are nowadays. Um, so beyond that, um, I can't comment on the interaction between the common law and, and Christianity. Although, you know, as a libertarian, I would hope over time, if we can get away from, you know, essentially, to me, the common law um, <coughs> is the rule of law, um, not the 45,000 pieces of legislation regulation by the federal government alone um, that we have today. That's, that's, not, that's being ruled by law, it's not rule of law. Um, so over time, you know, I'm a Christian, um, I don't sort of support like, oh, I have a problem with Islam and, and what, it, what it can be um, based on the fact that uh, uh, even though probably most Muslims are fairly ignorant of their own religion, which is probably a good thing to be honest, um, I don't advocate regulating them or anything like that. I'm a, I'm a libertarian, I prefer less regulation for everybody. Um, but I will advocate against it. I'll say, look, you know, this, this religion scares me because it um, advocates violence, uh, unlike Christianity. There's been a lot of bad Christians in history um, who've been violent. Um, I'll just point out it's a quick one. No one asked me about this, but the left always just throw the Crusades, you know, back at, oh, oh but the Crusades. Well, yeah, the, the Crusades happened about after 400 years of jihad in Europe, in particular in Spain. So it's, it, it, the left portrayed as though like Christians came out of nowhere to, with these crusades. It was after 400 years of being oppressed. All right, thanks. Well, that's all we've got time for for this panel. Please give it up for Darren and Wendy one more time. Thank you for the time.